Chapter 2 Inner Strength and Resilience Remember how much time you've already wasted, neglecting the opportunities given to you by the universe. It's crucial for you to understand the true nature of the world, of which you're a part, and of the universe's ruler, from whom you originated. There's a finite amount of time given to you. If you don't use it to soothe the turmoil in your soul, it will pass, taking you along with it, never to return. As a human being and a Roman, make it your constant concern to carry out your duties with sincerity, affection, freedom, and justice. As for all other worries and thoughts, figure out how to rid your mind of them. You can do this if you approach every task as if it were your last, free from vanity, free from emotional and willful deviation from reason, free from hypocrisy, self-love, and dislike of what the universe or God has given you. You see, the things necessary for a successful life and a divine existence are not many. The universe will not demand more from anyone who observes these principles. Go ahead, soul, disrespect, and scorn yourself. Soon the time for self-respect will be over. Everyone's happiness comes from within, but look, your life is nearing its end. While showing no respect for yourself, you've placed your happiness in the opinions and whims of others. Why do external events distract you so much? Take the time to learn something worthwhile and stop aimlessly wandering about. You also must avoid another kind of aimlessness, those who work hard in life but have no clear goal to guide their actions and desires are wasting their time. No one has ever been known to be unhappy for not observing the state of another's soul. Tell anyone who doesn't guide their soul's actions with reason and discretion that they are bound to be unhappy. Always keep these things in mind, the nature of the universe, your nature, the relationship between the two, what kind of part you are of the universe. No one can stop you from always acting and speaking in ways that align with your nature. Theophrastus, when comparing one sin to another, I concede such comparisons can be made in a conventional sense, wisely states that sins committed out of desire are worse than those committed out of anger. The angry person seems to turn away from reason with a kind of grief, while the person overcome by desire shows a more feeble, unmanly disposition in their sin. Thus, he rightly argues that the person who sins with pleasure is more blameworthy than the one who sins with grief. Indeed, the latter may first have been wronged and thus felt compelled to anger, while the former freely chooses their action out of desire. Whatever you desire or plan, do so as if you could die at any moment. If there are gods, leaving the company of humans is not a hardship. The gods won't harm you. But if there are no gods, or if they don't care about the world, why would you want to live in a godless, uncaring universe? But there are certainly gods, and they care about the world. They've given humans the power to avoid true evils, like vice and wickedness. If there were other truly bad things, they would have enabled us to avoid those too. Why should we see something as harmful if it doesn't make us better or worse? The universe didn't overlook these things out of ignorance or inability to prevent or manage them. It couldn't have allowed both good and bad things to happen to both good and bad people due to a lack of power or skill. Life, death, honor, dishonor, labor, pleasure, wealth, poverty, these things happen to everyone, good and bad alike. But they are neither good nor bad in themselves, neither shameful nor praiseworthy. Consider how quickly all things dissolve and transform, physical bodies and substances into the material of the world, and memories into the vast span of time. Consider the nature of all worldly tangible things, especially those that either entrap with pleasure, or are feared for their unpleasantness, or are highly valued for their outward appearance and demand, how worthless and contemptible, how base and corruptible, how devoid of all true life and existence they are. It is the part of a man with a good understanding to consider what they themselves truly are, from whose mere opinions and voices, honor and reputation arise, as well as what it is to die, and how if a man considers this alone, to die, and separates from it in his mind all those things which usually present themselves to us with it, he can perceive it no differently than as a work of nature, and he who fears any work of nature is truly a child. Now death, it is not only a work of nature, but also beneficial to nature. Consider with yourself how man, and by which part of him, is connected to God, 
and how that part of man is affected when it is said to be dispersed. There is nothing more miserable than that soul, which in a kind of circuit encompasses all things, probing, as he says, even the very depths of the earth, and by all signs and conjectures prying into the very thoughts of other men's souls, and yet of this, is not aware, that it is enough for a man to devote himself entirely, and to confine all his thoughts and cares to the nurturing of that spirit which is within him, and to truly and sincerely serve him. His service consists in this, that a man keeps himself pure from all violent passion and evil affection, from all impulsiveness and vanity, and from all manner of discontent, either regarding the gods or men. For indeed whatever comes from the gods, deserves respect for their worth and excellence, and whatever comes from men, as they are our relatives, should by us be treated, with love, always, sometimes, as coming from their ignorance, of what is truly good and bad, a blindness no less, than that by which we are unable to distinguish between white and black, with a kind of pity and compassion also. If you should live three thousand, or as many as ten thousand years, yet remember this, that man can lose no life properly, except the small part of life, which he now lives, and that which he lives, is no other, than that which at every moment he loses. That then which lasts longest, and that which is shortest, both have the same result. For although there may be some inequality regarding that which is already past, yet the time which is now present and existing, is equal for all men. And that being what we lose when we die, it clearly appears that it can only be a moment of time that we then lose. For as for the either past or yet to come, a man cannot be said properly to lose it. For how can a man lose what he does not have? Therefore, you must remember two things. First, that all things in the world from all eternity, by a perpetual cycle of the same times and things ever continued and renewed, are of one kind and nature, so that whether for a hundred or two hundred years only, or for an infinite amount of time, a man sees those things which are still the same, it cannot be of great importance. And secondly, that the life which any the longest living, or the shortest living person loses, is the same in length and duration, for only the present is what either of them can lose, as being the only thing, they have, for what he does not have, no man can truly be said to lose. Remember that all is just opinion and perception, for those things are clear and apparent, which were spoken to Monimus the Cynic, and as clear and apparent is the use that may be made of those things, if that which is true and serious in them, is accepted as well as that which is sweet and pleasing. A man's soul does wrong and disrespects itself first and especially, when as much as in itself lies it becomes a tumor, and as it were an outgrowth of the world, for to be upset and displeased with anything that happens in the world, is a direct departure from the nature of the universe, part of which, all individual natures of the world, are. Secondly, when she either avoids any man, or is led by opposing desires or affections, tending to his harm and prejudice, such as are the souls of those who are angry. Thirdly, when she is overcome by any pleasure or pain. Fourthly, when she does disguise, and secretly and falsely either does or says anything. Fifthly, when she either desires or strives for anything without a clear goal, but impulsively and without due reasoning and consideration, how consistent or inconsistent it is with the common goal. For even the smallest things should not be done without relation to the goal, and the goal of rational creatures is to follow and obey him, who is the reason as it were, and the law of this great city, an ancient commonwealth. The time of a man's life is as a point, the substance of it ever flowing, the sense obscure, and the whole composition of the body tending to decay. His soul is restless, fortune uncertain, and fame doubtful, in short, as a stream so are all things belonging to the body, as a dream, or a smoke, so are all that belong to the soul. Our existence is a battle and a journey. Fame after death is no better than being forgotten. What then will remain and follow us? Only one thing, philosophy. Philosophy consists of preserving our inner spirit from all forms of insults and harm, and above all, from both pain and pleasure. We should never act rashly, dishonestly, or hypocritically. We should rely on ourselves and our actions. We should accept everything that happens to us contentedly, as coming from the same source from which we came. Above all, we should calmly and humbly anticipate death, 
which is nothing more than the disintegration of the elements that make up every creature. If the elements themselves are unaffected by their constant transformation, why should anyone fear this disintegration and change, which is universal? Isn't this natural? But nothing that is natural can be evil. While I was in Carnuntum. Summary of Chapter 2 Here, Marcus Aurelius explores the concept of inner strength and resilience. He discusses how challenges and adversity can be opportunities for personal growth and how maintaining one's composure in the face of difficulties is a sign of strength. A notable quote in this chapter is, Our actions may be impeded, but there can be no impeding our intentions or dispositions.